News Channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, in that the left fights the right and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was in fact a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fact! Naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. Yeah. <laughs> We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. <laughs> Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. No spin, no bias, no censorship. I'm Dan Wooten tonight. Should Grant Shapps follow in Thatcher's footsteps and crush the RMT union, threatening calamitous summer walkouts that could result in blackouts, fuel shortages and empty supermarket shelves? In my digest next, I'll explain why we cannot let this Marxist group drag us back into the chaos and carnage of the 1970s in a bid to introduce a new era of far-left rule. Then my superstar panel will weigh in former Daily Star editor Dawn Neeson, conservative commentator Calvin Robinson and author and journalist Rebecca Reed. It's been a busy day for the Transport Secretary as he's also been wheeled out to defend Boris following that damp squib of a party gate smoking gun. With the greatest respect to you, I mean, both myself and I suspect by now your viewers are probably pretty keen to hear, you know, what we're doing to tackle cost of living, uh, what's happening with regard to these um, threatened rail strikes and much else. So is he right? Is it time we moved on from Partygate to focus on combating the cost of living crisis? Associate editor of the Daily Mirror, Kevin McGuire, journalist Angela Epstein and former advisor to David Cameron, Alex Dean, do battle in the clash at 9.20, when I'll get your verdict too. Someone who's certainly not moving on as London's failed mayor. So as Sadiq Khan questions why Boris wasn't fined by the Met, has Partygate now become a political witch hunt by the left? We'll debate at 10 p.m. Do we know enough about the long-term health consequences of the mRNA COVID vaccine? Top professor Christine Stable-Ben has been working on a bombshell study that raises important questions about the overall efficacy of jabs from the likes of Pfizer and Moderna. She'll reveal what she's uncovered at 10.20. Is there any justification for keeping face masks in healthcare settings? Dr Gary Sidley, who's authored an open letter to UK leaders and the NHS calling for them to be axed, joins me as his campaign attracts thousands of supporters. Don't miss Uncancelled at 10.40. Is Shakespeare about to be cancelled from classrooms? Will Britain's strictest headmistress and the star of a hit new ITV show, Catherine Burble sing, worries culturally relevant dead white men are about to be erased from your children's curriculum all in the name of diversification. She joins me live at 9.35. After his tone-deaf eaten mess protest at Downing Street over cheap meal deals, is Jamie Oliver actually just the embodiment of privilege? Well, man of the people, Darren Grimes, is tonight's outsider on that. Should police officers have to undergo mandatory lessons on black history? And deeply worrying news for friend of the show, Meghan Markle's father, Thomas, who is undergoing emergency treatment in hospital tonight after suffering a stroke. I'll bring you everything I know on that with the permission of his family. That's in the media buzz at 10.30. And after the controversial release of his Netflix comedy special, will Ricky Gervais be crowned either a greatest British or union jackass tonight? No, women. I, I mean the old-fashioned ones. You know, the old-fashioned women. Oh, God. You know, the ones with wombs. Oh. <laughs> 
I'm going to play you much more of that later on in the show. You're not going to want to miss it. And don't forget, a first look at tomorrow's newspapers too as they land. This is Dan Watson tonight. Let's go. Just one thing first, though, as I said in my digest last night, the monkeypox hysteria being spread by the health establishment, especially the shady and untrustworthy Chinese stooges at the World Health Organization, aided and abetted by the mainstream media, is gaslighting, pure and simple. The desire to make us scared by talking about an ailment that has been around for decades and has known treatments is part of the plan to keep us in some sort of perpetual cycle of fear and control. But rather than being concerned about terrifying millions, predictably, the only problem, the only problem the United Nations has with the scaremongering coverage is that it's, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it, you could probably guess, homophobic and racist. The Guardian reports today, the United Nations aid agency has called some reporting on the monkeypox virus racist and homophobic, warning of exacerbating stigma and undermining the response to the growing outbreak. But the next sentence of the report reads like this. UN aid said a significant proportion of recent monkeypox cases have been identified among gay, bisexual and other men who have sex with men. So as ever, this is woke PC madness stopping journalists to report facts about a health condition. Stop it now. And while you're at it, stop all the hysteria around monkeypox, those spreading it, you know exactly what you're doing. But now, an exciting moment. I'm delighted to welcome back our superstar panellist, Rebecca Reed, who has just returned after giving birth to her first baby. What, Rebecca, just, just a few weeks ago now. So, Rebecca, congratulations on becoming a mama. I know it's all you ever wanted. Has it lived up to it so far? <laughs> it's very, very, very nice to be back. Uh, I feel simultaneously very guilty for leaving her and delighted to be here, which I'm which I understand is apparently the feeling of parenthood forever. <laughs> well, I've missed you very much, but not as much as those alongside you on the sofa tonight. Former editor, current columnist at the Daily Star, Dawn Neeson back, alongside conservative commentator Calvin Robinson. I hope you're feeling fiery, though, Rebecca, right? Because you've got to keep us all in line, OK? <laughs> Absolutely. Trade unions. Can't get enough of them. <laughs> oh, goodness. You're annoying me already, but no, I'm <laughs> serious. It is brilliant to have you back. Uh, but before all of that, the news at nine with Polly Middlehurst. Dan, thank you. The top story. RMT rail workers have voted overwhelmingly to go on strike in a dispute over jobs, pay and conditions. Unions are warning this could be the biggest rail strike in modern history, which could create serious challenges in keeping goods and moving supermarkets, uh, uh, goods moving and supermarket shelves stocked. Over 40,000 staff members from Network Rail and 15 train companies took part in the vote. In other news, the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, has written to the Metropolitan Police asking for a detailed explanation of the force's decisions over individual cases in the Partygate investigation. That's, as leaked pictures published by ITV News show, the Prime Minister raising a glass at an office gathering in November 2020, when a national lockdown was in place. Boris Johnson had told MPs in Parliament there'd been no party that day. Downing Street is reportedly expecting to receive Sue Gray's report into lockdown parties tomorrow. The energy regulator Ofgem expects the energy price cap to rise by more than 40% this coming October. Appearing before a committee of MPs, the chief executive said households could be paying £2,800 a year. He says Russia's invasion of Ukraine means gas prices are volatile and he called on the government to help those who'll struggle to pay. Now, I know this is a very distressing time for customers, but I do need to be clear with this committee, with customers and with the government about the likely price implications for October. Therefore, later today, I will be writing to the Chancellor to give him our latest estimates of the price cap uplift. 
Now, this is uncertain. We are only part way through the price cap window, but we are expecting a price cap in October in the region of £2,800. The number of confirmed monkeypox cases in the UK has risen to 71. There are 14 new cases identified in England. UK health officials believe the risk to the population remains low, but they're keeping their advice under review. The World Health Organization says the monkeypox outbreak is containable. A teenage boy who fatally stabbed a 12-year-old girl over a Snapchat video row has been found guilty of her murder. He's been warned he faces a life sentence. Ava White was stabbed in the neck in Liverpool city centre on the evening of November the 25th last year. The court heard how Ava and her friends became involved in an argument with the 14-year-old and three of his friends after they recorded Snapchat videos of the group. The Premier League has approved the £4.25 billion proposed takeover of Chelsea Football Club today. It was from a consortium led by the LA Dodgers co-owner Todd Bowley. The club was put up for sale before owner Roman Abramovich was sanctioned over the links he had with the Russian President Vladimir Putin. Abramovich's ownership tenure will come to an end after 19 years at the top. On TV, online and on your radio via DAB+, you're with GB News. Now let's get more from Dan Wooten tonight. The National Union of Rail, Maritime and Transport Workers wants to return the UK to the hell of the 1970s. The Marxist Union is threatening summer walkouts that could result in blackouts, fuel shortages and empty supermarket shelves just as supply chain issues from two years of lockdown and the cost of living crisis really starts to bite. And breaking tonight, as you heard from Polly just minutes ago, the RMT Union has announced that railway workers have voted overwhelmingly, 89% to 11% in favour of strike action, paving the way for the biggest rail strike in modern history. So this country tonight is facing the very real prospect of grinding to a halt, with only 20% of trains able to run, meaning freight would have to be prioritised over passengers needing to travel the country. The Daily Mail reported today the Drax power station in North Yorkshire, responsible for servicing millions of homes, only has supplies stockpiled to cope for up to three days of disruption. Of course, the RMT is already threatening to bring chaos to the London Tube Network 24 hours after the Queen's Platinum Jubilee on the 6th of June, calling on every staff member to walk out as commuters return to work. And by the way, they're not finishing there. They're also intending to close down key stations in central London during the Jubilee weekend, bringing misery to members of the public hoping to celebrate the Queen. It's below the belt and it's shameful. Here is the hard-left RMT Secretary-General Mick Lynch saying the strikes could last for over six months, perhaps into next year. What we want is a negotiated settlement. So it's just the summer, though, is it we're talking about? Well, it depends when there's a settlement. We have to renew our uh, ballot mandates on a periodic basis. If we have to do that, we will. But we're determined what, to get what does, a How long does your mandate last for, just Six to be clear? Six months from tomorrow. Right, so this thing could trip into next year, even. Well, if there's no settlement, it will. All disputes have to end in a settlement, and we're ready to negotiate that with those employers. All right. But the government's hand is behind this. They're, the companies are delivering government policy, and like every public sector worker, they want to clamp down on, on pay. And the reason they want to do that is because they want to restore profit, mm. they want to boost dividends to the private operators, and that's true right across the economy, in my view. Now, that man is the same bloke who told The Guardian that, quote, all I want from life is a bit of socialism and that unions must, quote, make a militant stand and use the strike weapon. Same bloke, though, has earned a six-figure salary up until last year and lives in a West London home worth over £700,000, according to The Times newspaper today. The dispute involving the militant Labour Party supporting unions 40,000 members comes down to pay. Union chiefs reportedly want an 11% hike and also 2,500 job losses provided by National Rail. But as always, there are two sides to this story. 
government ministers point out that rail workers have already been handed pay rises higher than nurses, higher than teachers, higher than firefighters, higher than police officers. With railways being handed £16 billion since the start of the pandemic to cover for slumping passenger numbers caused by lockdown. Number 10 Downing Street declared yesterday any kind of disruption of this sort can have an impact on people's lives and their ability to get to work. That would be deeply unfair when families are struggling with some of these global challenges people are facing. The union should talk to the government before causing irreparable damage. Meanwhile, the Transport Salaried Staffs Association Union is also planning to ask its 20,000 members about strike action. Its General Secretary, Manuel Cortez, has already chillingly warned of a summer of discontent, with the biggest walkout since the 1926 general strike. How is that kind of walkout impacting critical infrastructure still legal in 2022? Well, Transport Secretary Grant Shapps hopes it won't be telling the Telegraph of a pledge in the Conservative manifesto explaining, we had a pledge in there about minimum service levels. If they really got to that point, then minimum service levels would be a way to work towards protecting those freight routes and those sorts of things. Can we just be honest for a moment about what this is really about? These unions want to cause chaos and carnage across the country in order to cripple the UK under Boris Johnson's Conservative government and welcome in a new era of far-left rule. Their workers are simply pawns in this highly political game. <clears throat> to respond now, my superstar panel, former editor, current columnist at The Daily Star, Dawn Neeson, the Conservative commentator, Calvin Robinson, and the author and journalist, Rebecca Reed. Calvin Robinson, what should the government do about this? They need to cripple the unions. The unions hold too much power. We've seen that over the last couple of years, the teachers' unions pretty much closed schools. They put so much pressure on the government that even before lockdowns took place, schools were closed. Uh, as for these train drivers that are already on 70 grand wanting more money, that, that reeks of greed to me. But the fact that they're thinking of crippling the entire country for up to six months to get their own way, that should not be appropriate. I think you used the right term of critical infrastructure. They should not have the ability to shut us down. Rebecca Reid, do you disagree? I sort of do. I mean, I obviously don't wish to be inconvenienced in any way. I like my life to be as easy as possible. Um, but I do think that, tra that unions are generally very important. And I think actually it demonstrates that all of us should be thinking about whether or not we're in a union. And we should all be trying to make our own union stronger because this demonstrates how efficient unions can be. I wish the National Union of Journalism was this, was this efficient because we don't tend to get much done. That's why it's such a badly paid profession. Dawn Neeson? I think there's a huge difference between uh, an efficient union and a militant union. And, um, you know, uh, the, the Arriva train drivers are on um, £60,945 a year, and that's up £10,000 in a year already. So they are all very, already very well paid compared to a lot of people in this country who are really, really going to be filling the pinch. And I, I, I do think now that we, we do need to... I, I don't agree with getting rid of the unions. I do think they had their place. But I do think they need to be controlled. And I think Grant Shapps is actually talking some sense about making sure that some services do run. Calvin, the issue is the tactics from this mob are Marxist, pure and simple. Yeah, and they always are. These unions have all become very political, very militant. Uh, and, we, you know, we saw this, again, with teachers' unions wanting kids to wear masks around school, wanting kids to test every day. And all of the pressure that they put on the government is always party political. Whatever decision the Conservative government makes, the unions want the opposite. And I think Thatcher had it right in, you know, cutting them down to shape. I'm not saying get rid of them entirely, because pe people want to join a union, that's on them. I never have wanted to. But, if you, you know, they shouldn't have as much political power as they do. I mean, Rebecca Reid, so we, we've got, just got the statement in from Mick Lynch following this overwhelming vote. And he says, today's overwhelming endorsement by railway workers is a vindication of the union's approach and sends a clear message that members want a decent pay rise, job security and no compulsory redundancies. The issue is, Rebecca, is not as many people are travelling on trains. Well, yeah. So where is this money going mm. to come from? Well, also, I mean, we all want that, right? If, if I said to any of us, would any of you like more money and total job security? <laughs> I'd be like, yes. So, um, so the union's leader's job is to make the people in the union happy, and what makes people happy is more money and more security. So it's all working very well for them. And, it, and I suppose if I were in that union, I'd be thinking, not my problem, find the money. You need the train, find the money. Mm. Otherwise, we have to have a general strike situation, like in the... 20, in the uh, I think it was around the time 
um, before the Second World War, when Nancy Mitford was driving a bus. And I do think that would be quite fun too. I think if we're going to have a general strike, at least that's all let's pitch in. Calvin, would you drive a bus? Uh... That's a good point, actually. If everyone's striking, they should get fired, and we should replace them with people. Well, that is what happened. That Absolutely, is what happened yeah. before. I, mean, I don't love it, but that is what happens. And I don't think I could drive a bus, but I think I could drive the. D I could probably be on the DLR in the supervisory <laughs> capacity. Look, look, at the end of the day, I want people being in jobs as much as possible. I don't like AI replacing humans. No, 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 I know how I feel no, about the robot. Yeah, exactly, and I'm against the automated tills. Yeah. But the problem is, Dawn. If they continue down this militant path, mm. that's exactly what will happen. Because, you know, there doesn't actually have to be drivers yeah. in most trains the these thing, days. I mean... It's a luxury. Now, I'm all for it. But if they're going to act this unreasonably, mm. then, unfortunately, they're going to be in for a short, sharp shock because we can't cope with this economically. It's it's very dangerous road to go down at the moment when we have we have already the DLR in London which is all yeah. completely no Most drivers. Um, and and we one of the jobs that is predicted to disappear in, in you know coming soon is train drivers. So it's it's they've got to be very careful here and this is not going to win the public over. No. No. I it, mean, this is really the thing it, and it really when it comes to who will stand up for you when the jobs are all scrapped. Yeah. The people who didn't get yeah. to go to work on time yeah. might not feel yeah. like going out oh, and, and good on you Mick Lynch by the way you absolute scumbag for targeting the queen yeah good one that makes perfect sense doesn't it try and get the headlines but stop people from celebrating the 70th anniversary on the throne of her majesty that makes you a scumbag mate and I think Rebecca's right you're not going to get the support of the country with tactics like that Rebecca Reed, great to have you back Calvin Robinson and Dawn Neeson both here as well but coming up is Shakespeare to be or not to be on our children's curriculum? That is the question giving Britain's strictest headmistress sleepless nights. Catherine Burblesing, star of a hit new ITV show, joins me to discuss her battle to stop dead white men, her words being raised from the classroom. But first, as the liberal media continue their political witch hunt, is it time we all moved on from Partygate to focus on real issues like combating the cost of living crisis? Associate editor of the Daily Mirror, Kevin Maguire, journalist Angela Epstein and former advisor to David Cameron, Alex Dean, do battle in the clash next. Your voice most important on this show, though, so what do you think about this one? Are you ready to move on from Partygate like I have been for some time? Dan at GBNews.uk. Tweet me at GBNews. Our poll running there, too. The results coming up after the break. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, and that the left fights the right, and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was, in fact, a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. <laughs> yeah. We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Britain's strictest head mistress, Catherine Burblesing, and Darren Grimes coming up at time now for The Clash.
Of course, the mainstream media remains completely obsessed with Partygate as it continues efforts to derail Boris Johnson. Tonight, the BBC aired an hour-long documentary dedicated to the drama where they encourage yet more hysteria over Downing Street parties. There was no party. All guidance was followed uh, completely during number 10. As Boris Johnson prepares for the end of the official investigation into pandemic parties, we reveal what happened behind the world's most famous front door. Slight problem. They didn't speak to one person on the record. And Sly News really outdid themselves earlier today with their deputy political editor, Sam Coates, putting on quite a performance outside number 10. Did you lie at the dispatch box, Prime Minister? Do you endorse law-breaking in Cabinet, Pretty Patel? Is Partygate embarrassing on the world stage, Foreign Secretary? Are you being loyal to save your job? Do you think a future Prime Minister would make you Foreign Secretary? Do you want to replace Boris Johnson? Would you defend anything at all, Grant Chaps? Has Boris Johnson got a better grip on, the on government than you had on the Foreign Office last year? Did Boris Johnson lie at the dispatch box, Nadim Zahawi? Or would you prefer to succeed him as Prime Minister? Did you talk about Partygate and Cabinet, or is it easier to hear no evil and see no evil? I bet there are. I think the man might be better suited to the West End stage. Well, Transport Secretary Grant Shapps was thrown to the lion's den this morning, and he offered a kindly reminder of the far greater issues that the public really wish to hear about. This doesn't look good, does well, it? At a time well, when you should be trying, as a government, to clear things up, to offer some kind of clarity and openness and transparency, this looks like a mess. It looks like you're trying to hide stuff. Well, with the greatest respect to you, I mean, both myself and I suspect by now your viewers are probably pretty keen to hear, you know, what we're doing to tackle costs of living, uh, what's happening with regard to these um, threatened rail strikes and much else. And, and so, in a way, you're perpetuating it by continuing to talk about it. I think he's right. But do you? Is it time we moved on from Partygate to focus on combating the cost of living crisis? Let me know your thoughts by emailing dan at gbnews.uk. Tweet me at gbnews. Vote in our poll there too. I'll bring you those results shortly. But to help you make up your mind tonight, I'm joined by the associate editor of The Daily Mirror, Kevin Maguire, the journalist, Angela Epstein, and conservative commentator, Alex Dean. So, Alex Dean, you were, of course, a former advisor to David Cameron. Do you feel like the media hysteria over this matches the crime? No, I don't. I think some people in Westminster and in the media need to calm down a bit. And I think that most people in the country have pretty much moved on from this already. That's not to say that everything's fine in government. I, as a Conservative, want to see this government delivering on a Conservative agenda. I think if there was ever a time for tax cuts, that time is now. I think Grant Shapps was right when he was talking about energy crisis, uh, cost of living crisis. The answer to me as a Tory is obvious. We've got to lower the costs that people pay for things. We should be looking at unilateral tariff dropping. We should be more supportive of Ukraine. There's a world of things for government to do now. And I doubt very few people really care about Boris and Partygate. Angela Epstein, you don't think the Prime Minister should go over Partygate? No, I mean, look, I think even anybody who has the most slavish pop star style devotion, blind devotion to Boris Johnson, would be pushed not to admit that it looked sounded and um, where the, the offences have been, sound, been found to be true, dreadful. And I think it's all very well saying push it aside. Let's pause for a moment and all agree it was awful. They shouldn't have been doing it. I accept it. I, you know, I've supported Boris Johnson, but I accept people are hurting without wishing to be melodramatic because of all the things we know they couldn't do and the loved ones we lost. We all know that, but we have to be proportionate and ask ourselves, what are we now achieving? This has kind of been, um, uh, the, the optics are, are, are multi-perspective because you've got Sue Gray's the report, then the bit redacted because it had to go to the Met, and then you've got internal investigations, and we've got this kind of mosaic response, um, coupled with Laura uh, Koonsberg talking about melodramatic, sort of very melodramatic documentary this evening on BBC Two, uh, which, as you said, didn't put in, which, as you said, didn't uh, you know, didn't involve people on the record. Not and one. The, the, the fabled. Not one. These actors were. 
actors' voices. You know, the actors' voices. You always oh, yeah. want to do the kind of Euro trash stuff and put on silly accents. But this is not to make it silly. We all know it hurt, but we have to say to ourselves all the things that Alex just said. Cost of living crisis. Look how much the energy bills are going to soar. Eight hundred pounds at the very least. Uh, Putin with his stuttering finger over the trigger. I mean, monkeypox. It. You couldn't make it up. Um, this is a country rail strikes. So I don't need to give you the shopping list of disasters that are waiting to happen. So let's acknowledge. Let's learn. Let's apologise and not demean those people yeah. who suffered. Exactly. But, please, but in fact, as Boris Johnson has apologised for months and months on end. I mean, Kevin Maguire, uh, you don't seem to care at all that Keir rage over the fact that Boris Johnson issued a toast to his departing press secretary or director of communications at a leaving do. What's the difference, Kevin? Dan, if Keir Starmer is found to have broken the law at the time and is fined, then he has to go. Boris Johnson was fined because he broke the law at the time and he should have gone and he didn't. Look, I take an even-handed approach to both men here. And I think Alex and Angela are both wrong when they think uh, people don't care. People do care because people made huge sacrifices. They don't like to be taken for fools. They don't like the wine in that glass raised by the Prime Minister to be thrown in their faces when he was lecturing them almost nightly to follow the rules, and he wasn't doing it himself with his team. And you have the first prime minister in history to be fined in office. He clings on now. He clearly lied to MPs. Once the Gray report is out the way tomorrow, there'll be an inquiry by the Privileges Committee into whether he lied. And we can't move on until he moves on. And you okay, but Kevin, just to pick you up about what you right said about that event. Living, and a lot of other issues, when the bloke is clearly chaotic, totally self-serving, happy to throw juniors under the bus and rarely tell the truth. Kevin, can I just pick you up on the specifics of the event that you talk about, though? Because he wasn't fined at all for that picture that everyone's getting so worked up about. He was fined... Uh, for being presented with a birthday cake that never left its Tupperware container. I mean, are you seriously saying that that reaches the standards of overthrowing a democratic mandate? He didn't challenge the birthday uh, party, did he? Now, you, you look at that picture, you look at everyone around it, all the empty bottles, a half a gin bottle, the bottle of fizz, and you wonder why the police didn't investigate that. When we get the Grey report tomorrow, I suspect it will be very, very factual. It won't call for recommendations about whether the Prime Minister goes or stays. It may address, as the interim report, the brief report did, the culture in Downing Street, which uh, just seemed to be boozy b bashers. It was Party Street. At times, it was the only nightclub left uh, open in London. Yeah, I do think uh, he should go if his personal standards fall so below what we should expect okay. in the Alex highest Dean, office of your state. response. Yeah, Dan, I, I get that Kevin wants the Prime Minister to go. That's <laughs> yes, the, we the, get the, that. logical <laughs> position for a left-wing journalist. And I understand, I sort of respect him. I mean, at least he's consistent, right? But what isn't consistent, and this is, I think, the biggest potential problem to come out of this whole episode, it's not about the specifics of individuals and what they did. It's what people are now saying about the rule of law. Kevin says, I, this leaves me wondering why the police didn't investigate X, because he didn't get the result out of a police investigation that he wanted. I think that's bad. And worse, there's only one person in this situation who's been going around saying that you should resign if you're investigated, not convicted, undermining the notion of the presumption of innocence. You should resign if you're investigated. And that was Keir Starmer. Mm. Well, he's being investigated now, and he hasn't resigned, has yeah, So why didn't he go for that, Kevin? Why didn't he go for no, that? I, I, I understand Alex's uh, criticism of that, and to some extent I share it. I don't think he was particularly wise on that, but you could see that Boris Johnson, it was clear from the evidence right from the beginning, was guilty. And so it turned out, at least on this one incident. But the main point, and you've got to see it, and you can criticise Keir Starmer as much as you like, but the Prime Minister, who is an incredibly powerful person in this country, broke the law. He broke draconian laws that he set for everybody else. He didn't follow himself. And I think, I think I'm, maybe you can call me old-fashioned if you like, Dan, but I think the rulers 
who set the rules for the ruled should follow them, and if they don't, they should be out. Now, Andorra Well, Angela system, Epstein, how do you respond to, to that decide. point? They will suck him or they will not. They will be tainted, I believe, if they don't. And I, I think if you were Keir Starmer in Labour, you would want Boris Johnson not to go. Yeah, they want the juicy uh, sc uh, scalp in public. That's quite clear. But you want him to stumble on to the next election because he is no longer the great well, vote I winner. Well, I disagree with that because, be because he's, people he's still do care about it. The people most have popular standards. Oh, Kevin, Kevin, times. calm down. It's not good for your <laughs> blood pressure. I mean, first of all, I take issue with the fact that you said... Uh, Alex and I don't care. I can't speak for Alex. He seems competent enough to speak for himself. Um, I preface all my comments by saying I do care. Um, thank God I didn't lose anybody, but there were very close loved ones I didn't see for a long time. And I think we're confusing parity between not seeing loved ones, not being able to to be with those close to us, or, or if very tragically going to funerals or spend with being in a workplace where, yes, there was too much merriment and, and jocularity, but being already in that workplace in a so-called bubble, the the two are not the same. I am not condoning what went on. But if you go on and on about the small stuff or the relatively small stuff, you also run the risk of wiping out the goodwill, the reservoir of goodwill that comes from the big stuff, the big calls, the vaccine programme, the statesmanlike behaviour over Ukraine, leading front and centre compared to the rest of Europe. And also, I think you also undervalue the popularity that Boris Johnson still has as a political yeah. talent. Before Big this time. whole dog and pony, before this dog and pony show kicked off, and I, I'm not going to keep repeating myself, it was wrong. But I think, first of all, what I hear is there are a lot of people that hold the nose and say, I still want Boris there because at least we know who he is compared to kind of the, the milk and water potential successors. I mean, if Starmer and Boris went, not only would it massively destabilise us at, at a time when, as I said before, all these horrible things are going on and these these uncertain things are going on but who are the people that would least say this is where i am and what i stand for we're going to have our liberty i'm not an interventionist we're going to have a vaccine program that's going to get us out of here we're going to get brexit done um i don't see anybody on the political landscape who will do that and even those no. that were hurt his detractors recognized you know, there was a chap on, on Radio 4 this afternoon saying his majority went from 500 to whatever it was, 4,000, because of Boris Johnson. And I Indeed. think you need a party Indeed. where people and are And never are underestimate Boris Johnson because you do that at your peril. Fascinating debate. That's the journalist Angela Epstein. Before that, the associate editor of The Daily Mirror, Kevin Maguire, and the conservative commentator, Alex Dean. So who do you agree with on this? Well, Jonathan on Twitter writes to say, I'm annoyed and angry that the MSM still can't get it out of their heads that Partygate is over. From Ben via email, we can hold politicians to account while trying to help the cost of living crisis. We can do both. And from Ali, no questions, of course we should. This is a concerted attempt by the left and remain biased media to bring down a democratically elected PM. And this must not be allowed to happen. We voted Tory because we wanted Boris for PM. And your verdict is now in. Wow. 84% of you, overwhelming number of you, believe that we should move on from Partygate to focus on battling the cost of living crisis. Just 16% of you say the current MSM focus on Partygate is right. Only one more day of it, folks, I promise you. The Sue Gray report should be released tomorrow. Please, God, then let it be over. Coming up, as Jamie Oliver finds himself in a jam over his eaten mess protest, is the celebrity chef the embodiment of privilege after pushing to axe cheap meal deals? Well, Darren Grimes is here to give Jamie a piece of his mind in The Outsider at 9.50. But first, is Shakespeare about to be cancelled in schools? The left will say the prospect is much to do about nothing, but Britain's strictest headmistress and the star of a hit new ITV show, Catherine Burr, will sing things differently. She joins me straight after the break to discuss the dangerous decolonizing of classrooms. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilized conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. 
every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, and that the left fights the right, and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was, in fact, a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fact! Naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. Yeah. <laughs> We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews, and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship, and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. My next guest is proud to be nicknamed Britain's strictest headmistress and has become one of the most talked about people in the UK this week after starring in a new ITV documentary of the same name. Catherine Burblesing is an educational firebrand whose revolutionary ideas are now influencing policy and changing the lives of inner city kids at the free school she founded called Michaela Community School. Take a quick look at her in action on ITV. So you and I had a conversation at break time. You said to me, yes, miss, I really want to get it right, miss. And then this happens. You've said to me, you really want to be at this school. You've said to me that you understand why the rules are here and why you need to behave yourself. A couple of hours later, you were in the corridors misbehaving. I think to myself, what you were telling me just isn't true. I'm so disappointed, Corliss. I am so disappointed. You don't want to mess with her now. Catherine was recently appointed as the chair of the government's Social Mobility Commission, but has faced backlash from the left, of course, for attacking woke culture. She's fighting against pushback yet again from the PC mob this week for her perfectly reasonable suggestion that the so-called dead white men like Shakespeare should still be taught in schools. UK exam boards have added more ethnic minority authors to their reading list since the 2020 BLM protests after pupils began pressuring schools into decolonizing campaigns. But Catherine has urged teachers to ignore the woke noise and avoid scrapping historical novels and cultural icons like Shakespeare and Dickens. She wants less focus on race and gender and describes the ideas in their work as universal, which they clearly are. I'm delighted to say that Catherine joins me now. Catherine, I'll, I'll talk about the show, uh, which was brilliant, by the way, in just a moment. But but first, do do classic texts and and literary greats like Shakespeare genuinely face being cancelled from schools as a result of this so-called decolonization of the curriculum? Well, I don't think that will happen now. When I was being interviewed, I was saying that that's to come. It's certainly happening in places in America, and we tend to copy America. You know, they say when America sneezes, the rest of the world catches a cold. And um, we have been following America in all sorts of ways with regard to critical race theory, um, separating white kids from black kids. There was that whole program on Channel 4 uh, called The School That Tried to Stop Racism, when really it should have been called The School That Tried to Stoke Racism. Um, when you tell all the white kids that they're responsible for all the ills in the world and the, the black kids are all good uh, for being black, that is actually encouraging children to be racist as far as I'm concerned. So um, it's already the case that we're going down that road. And my worry is that Look, I'm not saying we shouldn't teach any black authors. I'm a black author myself. So I'm not saying, uh, you know, we teach um, Andrea Levy, Small Island, who are in our English A-level. We went and took the kids to see Small Island at the National Theatre. It was a wonderful play. Having said that, I do think that dead white men are really important. And these days, they are getting cut more and more. Uh, Shakespeare is certainly still featuring. But at Michaela, we teach four Shakespeare plays, Macbeth, um, Othello, um, 
Romeo and Juliet and Caesar. We get them to memorize some of Caesar's speech on courage and they, they belt it out. That sort of thing, those traditional ways of teaching, uh, we sing Jerusalem, God save the queen, I vow to thee my country. That is very, very rare um, if, if, if it happens at all in places. You know, I, I have to say I visited many, many, many schools and I, I don't really see that happening. So, um, when I say eventually Shakespeare will go, it could be in three years, it could be in 10 years, it could be in 15 years, I don't know. But I do think that's the way that we're heading. I think you're completely right, by the way. I mean, you only have to look at the way that the Globe Theatre now fails to stand up for Shakespeare and is even trying to decolonise the work. I would say if there's any organisation that should be standing up for Shakespeare, it should be the Globe. So, so I think Shakespeare is a threat, actually, and I think it is a huge concern. Well, and, and why should we teach Shakespeare? Because I often have to defend this. And I have to say things like Shakespeare has been influencing literature for the last 400 years. Um, and I would never want Shakespeare replaced by books that I've written. But, you know, if the day ever comes that I have been influencing literature for 400 years, then by all means, teach me in schools. But for now, I think we should be sticking with Shakespeare. Um, the other thing that's interesting is the way in which Shakespeare is now taught. So, for instance, schools that will teach Othello, rather than seeing Othello the character as a, as a Moor and as the other, which is which in the Jacobean uh, times, then that that's how they would have been thinking of him. It's very much taught as a play about race and about a black man, and that is not really how it ought to be interpreted. So it's also the way in which Shakespeare is actually being taught that is is not under threat, that's happening right now, uh, where they'll talk about is Shakespeare an anti-Semite, is Shakespeare a racist, is Shakespeare a misogynist, and so on. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying you can't have that conversation at all, but when most of your conversations are, are, mm. are around that, that's where it becomes problematic. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, now, look, Catherine, you have obviously been a public figure to some degree since 2010 and, and that landmark speech that put you on the map at, at the Tory party conference. But I think this week it really went to another level with this big ITV primetime Sunday night documentary about you and your school, but it very much was focused on you and your personal education philosophy. So, so tell me what it's been like, the response this week. Have you had largely a positive reaction to, to your methods or has there been a lot of pushback? Because, of course, ITV these days is, is, is a pretty woke channel usually, so I imagine some of their viewers were quite shocked by some of your practices. Well, you know, it was really interesting because... I have to say the overwhelming response from people has been extremely positive. We've had a number of emails through the school, a lot from the older generation, actually, who are saying, you know, I thought these kinds of schools had disappeared. We're so pleased someone's doing something. It's so, I'm so happy to see tradition. I'm so happy to see good discipline. Um, and, you know, if your viewers want to see it, they can go on the ITV hub for the shorter version. There's a 45 minute version on ITV. But there's also a website by the producer uh, where they have the full 90 minute feature uh, called Strictest headmistress.com. I mean, it's a bit of a silly name, strictestheadmistress.com. But if you go there, you will see the full 90 minutes, which does give you a real sense of the school. And I would say for families too, there are 12 rules that I give for how to raise children, whether you're a teacher or a parent, what should you be doing with your child to make sure that they grow up into a happy and loved and purposeful human being, you know, as an adult. And um, I, I found like our electrician at school, he saw it and he said, it's made him into a better father. So that's all that I want really is to just try and spread the word about what works with kids because um, th this stuff really does work. And it's the stuff, as I say in the documentary, I say it's the stuff that your grandmother would have told you. You know, she knows and she knew. It's just that we've sort of lost a lot of that recently and we need to get it back. No, indeed. My dad is a headmaster actually. And I'm very proud of him and he's about to retire. And I I do worry that, that his generation is dying out. And so I think it's so important to see you sticking to some of these very traditional things that are so important. Like, for example, no, you're not having your phone in school, by the way, which lots of schools these days don't say. Yeah. 
Well, exactly. You've got schools where they've got their AirPods in, they've got yeah. their phones out in lessons. The, the teacher is asking to take the phones out so that they supposedly can do some work. It's just, it's terrible. And um, I think it should be obvious that we shouldn't be having phones in schools and in the classrooms. It's obvious to me that parents shouldn't give their children unsupervised access to the internet. That's one of my rules. And that can be difficult because parents don't really understand just how much um, bad stuff they can access on the internet, the kinds of people that they can meet. People know where you live, what your child, who your child's friends are, their route to school. I mean, you have no idea. And then suddenly your child starts lying to you and you don't know why. And it's because of people that they met on that unsupervised uh, device that you, that you gave them. So it, it's really, I'm just making a plea to parents to, to listen and to think about these ideas. And there are so many teachers actually who have got in touch with me to say, oh my goodness, the school looks fantastic. Thanks so much for, for yeah. just flying oh. the fa flag on discipline, flying the flag on old fashioned teaching from the front of the class where the teacher is the authority leading the yeah. learning. Well, the line that really stuck with me most, actually, when I think of the whole documentary, was the fact that you view discipline as love. Showing discipline is also showing love, which is something that doesn't go together in this modern world. Yes, that's right. So people think if you're strict, that means you're mean. But actually, I'd say if you're strict, that means you really love them because you love them enough to hold your standards really high for them. So when I'm getting upset with that boy who you just saw, and he's in the program, yeah. and I'm telling him off, he's tripped somebody up on the stairs. You know, he's not even tripped them. He's kicked them slightly. It's a small thing. And um, now if I don't make a big deal about that small thing, then he's gonna do bigger and bigger things. But you make a big deal of the small things and then the big things just don't happen. And that boy who is spinning out of control at his old school comes to us. Now he's moving into year 10 in September. He's all set for his GCSEs. He's completely transformed that child. You know, so <laughs> that's what you want is to be Absolutely. doing that for as many children as you can. And you are more likely to do that for more children <laughs> if you keep your standards high and love them love them enough to keep your standards high and be really strict with them. Couldn't agree more. I think you're absolutely brilliant. And it was a really, really fascinating insight to the work that you've done at Michaela Catherine Burble Singh, who is featured Thanks. in Britain's strictest head teacher. Thank you, Catherine. We'll speak soon. But coming up, as Sadiq Khan questions why Boris wasn't fined by the Met, has Partygate now become a political witch hunt by the left? My superstar panel and I will debate that in the media bars after 10. First look at tomorrow's newspaper front page is there too. But first, after an Eton mess protest at Downing Street over cheap meal deals, is it time privileged Jamie Oliver got his just desserts? TV News' very own Darren Grimes takes him to task in The Outsider next. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, and that the left fights the right, and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was, in fact, a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. <laughs> yeah. We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. 
I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. A first look at tomorrow's newspaper front page is coming up just after 10. But first, Darren Grimes is tonight's outsider. And with Jamie Oliver's Downing Street stunt leaving him looking like a spotted dick, does his Eton mess protest outside number 10 prove he's the embodiment of the metropolitan elite? Here's a reminder of how the multi-millionaire TV chef responded to Boris Johnson's U-turn on a pledge to ban buy one, get one free food deal. I say eaten, you say? No! I say eaten, you yes. say? No! I say eaten, you say? No! Say Jamie, it's okay. Well, we don't want a U turn, do we, guys? No! So, we want to put child health first. The strategy was looking world class. Uh, now it doesn't. And it's our job uh, to put it all back together again and make sure that we can build a better future for our kids. Hmm, very tone deaf, I think, at a time when the country is suffering the worst household finance crisis in decades and many have been forced to choose between heating or eating. In that context, scrapping good value supermarket food deals for the needy and vulnerable is surely the last thing Jamie Oliver should be campaigning for. In fact, that was probably the most privileged protest I've ever seen. So, Darren Grimes, is Jamie Oliver just dead wrong on this? Look, Dan, I think actually most viewers tonight watching that clip there, they might well think Jamie Oliver's heart's in the right place in actually seeking to ensure that kids and others aren't eating exclusively terrible food. But as you rightly say, we haven't seen a cost of living crisis like this for generations, right? Seeking a ban on these buy one, get one free offers, or, or bog off offers, as, as they're called. I tell you what, Dan, the only person I want to bog off is Jamie Oliver, because I think that actually this would be a really, really incredibly regressive move. And he's a hypocrite as well, right? This man on his website, if you want to make Jamie Oliver's eaten mess, guess how much sugar it contains, Dan? 300 <laughs> grams, 300 grams of sugar. And you just think, he has this deal with, with Shell, I think it is, petrol stations up and down this country, Dan, stocking Jamie Oliver fast food. There are steak bakes and steak slices and these sort of things, which contain massive amounts of fat. But of course, Jamie Oliver will be receiving quite the nice pay packet off of the sale of those. And if you ask me, you look at his record, Dan, right? It's a long and proud record of seeking to impose taxes, bans, and frankly, those that exclusively hit the poorest hardest. Because if you think about the, the sugar tax, you can't say it's worked really. All it's done is that if you fancy a full fat Coke, for example, you're gonna get it, but you're just gonna end up paying the tax. All sorts of things. If you consider the fact that he, in the agriculture bill last year, he tried to actually ensure that we couldn't have trade deals with economies like New Zealand, Dan, because they would have to meet our laws and standards word for word. Every single law would have to be the same. That would preclude us from doing any trade deal whatsoever. That means businesses can't actually trade. Consumers can't benefit from goods that we actually don't manufacture or, or produce, aren't able to grow in this country. Things like that, where actually he has been an ultimate menace. And this is a menace from a I, report suggests he has a £6 million mansion, right? This is someone hectoring, lecturing the British people. And all of these measures take calories on restaurant menus, Dan. Do you honestly believe that anyone sat in a Weatherspoons with a pint and a burger is going to take one iota, one jot of notice at the calorie count? If they want a burger, they want a pint, they're going to have it, right? This is a, a no-nonsense country in which I think people are a little bit fed up 
of the government and, and elites, frankly, telling people what they can and can't do. And it is interesting that he's in waxing lyrical outside of number 10 Downing Street there. All of that group that he was with, right, look, they, they I imagine, live exclusively off of a diet of quinoa, right, and all of these other fancy new salads, and are pro all of these green taxes and things like that, which again, disproportionately hit the poorest. It's a neo-feudalism, right, where you've got these elites coming over, telling where that actually you can't eat that, that's not good for you, oh, you can't have holidays, you can't eat cheap meat. All of these things, I think, are symptomatic of an elite which is out of control. And I think far too many are actually being listened to on issues like these. So I'm actually pleased with the government, but the government haven't actually scrapped their ban on buy one, get one free offers. They've delayed it, right? It's a temporary delay, they say. I think it should be scrapped outright. I think it's an absolute, you cannot imagine the, the hardship that families up and down this country, especially in areas like this here, up here in the Northeast, energy bills and all of the rest of it. Jamie Oliver's not going to struggle, as you say, Dan, to put, Bring the, you in. To put the lights on. But in seeking to buy, ban, buy one, get one free offers when people are struggling so badly, I think he's proven, he's shown himself to be an out of touch prat, to be frank. <laughs> Darren Grimes has spoken. Darren Grimes, thank you so much. And of course, Darren Show Real Britain, Saturday and Sunday afternoons here on GB News. It's 10 p.m. I'm Dan Wooten. Tonight, should police officers be given mandatory lessons in black history in a bid to tackle apparent racism within the nation's forces? And should they also be forced to embrace being called woke? I say, why on earth would we want woke coppers? I want tough coppers who are going to stop crime. But I'll debate that next with my superstar panel, the former Daily Star editor Dawn Neeson, conservative commentator Calvin Robinson, and the author and journalist Rebecca Reed. Do we know enough about the long-term health consequences of the mRNA COVID vaccine? Top professor Christine stable Ben has been working on a bombshell study that raises important questions about the overall efficacy of jabs from the likes of Pfizer and Moderna. She'll reveal what she's uncovered. It may well surprise you at 10.20. Is there any justification for continuing to muzzle staff, patients and visitors in healthcare settings? Well, Dr Gary Sidley has written an open letter to UK leaders and the NHS calling for face masks to be axed. He'll tell us all about his campaign, which has already attracted thousands of supporters in Uncancelled at 10.40. As the failed mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, goes after the Met Police for their investigation into Downing Street parties... Photograph that I saw for the first time yesterday. Well, I think the prospect country scratching their heads how it is that even more fines haven't been issued. Do his comments prove Partygate is now just a political witch hunt from the left? We'll debate that next. It was less than a month ago that Thomas Markle spoke of his dream of finally reuniting with Meghan and Harry at the Platinum Jubilee. If they do come, I, I would love to. I would love to uh, reach out and uh, and and speak with them and and uh, and try to figure out what what went wrong and how we can repair it. But in a tragic twist of fate today, I revealed earlier with the family's blessing that Thomas has been rushed to hospital after suffering from a major stroke. I'll issue a plea for Meghan to let this spell the end of her one-sided feud in the media buzz at 10.30. And after the controversial release of his Netflix comedy special, will Ricky Gervais be crowned either a Greatest Britain or Union Jackass tonight for this? Oh, they want to use our toilets. Why shouldn't they use your toilets? For ladies. They are ladies. Look at their pronouns. <laughs> <laughs> Big hour ahead, we'll have the newspaper front pages for you too. But first, the headlines at 10 with Polly Middlehurst. Dan, thank you. Well, the breaking news tonight is that rail workers have voted to go on strike in a dispute over jobs, pay and conditions. 
Unions are warning this could be the biggest rail strike in modern history, which could create serious challenges in keeping goods moving and keeping supermarket shelves stocked. Over 40,000 staff members from Network Rail and 15 other train companies took part in the vote. More on that as we get it. In other news, the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, has written to the Metropolitan Police asking for a detailed explanation of the force's decisions over individual cases in the Partygate investigation. That's as leaked pictures published by ITV News show the Prime Minister raising a glass at an office gathering in November 2020 when a national lockdown was still in place. Boris Johnson had told MPs in Parliament there'd been no party that day. Downing Street is reportedly expecting to receive Sue Gray's report into lockdown parties tomorrow. The energy regulator has said that there is a warning ahead and he expects energy prices, the energy price cap that is, to rise by more than 40% in October. Appearing before a committee of MPs, the chief executive Jonathan Brearley said households could be paying £2,800 a year. He says Russia's invasion of Ukraine means gas prices are highly volatile and he called on the government to help those who struggle to pay. Now, I know this is a very distressing time for customers, but I do need to be clear with this committee, with customers and with the government about the likely price implications for October. Therefore, later today, I will be writing to the Chancellor to give him our latest estimates of the price cap uplift. Now, this is uncertain. We are only part way through the price cap window, but we are expecting a price cap in October in the region of £2,800. A teenage boy who fatally stabbed a 12-year-old girl over a Snapchat video has been found guilty of her murder. He's been warned he faces a life sentence. Ava White was stabbed in the neck in Liverpool city centre on the evening of November the 25th last year. The court heard how Ava and her friends became involved in an argument with the 14-year-old boy and three of his friends after the boys recorded Snapchat videos of the group. And more breaking news this evening. 15 people have been killed in a shooting at an elementary school in Texas in the United States. The state's Governor Greg Abbott says a gunman shot one teacher and 14 students. A suspect has been taken into custody after an active shooter in Olvad. Earlier, the Consolidated Independent School District said the shooter was located at Robb Elementary School and asked people not to visit the campus. More on that as we get it as well. Here, the number of confirmed monkeypox cases in the UK has risen to 71, with 14 new cases being identified in England. UK health officials believe the risk to the population remains low, but they're keeping their advice under review. The World Health Organization says the monkeypox outbreak is, it thinks, containable. On TV, online and on your radio via DAB+, you're with GB News. Now more from Dan Wooden tonight. Tomorrow's news tonight, now in our media buzz. One front page in, it's the Metro that leads on claims that drunk number 10 staff pulled all-nighters in Downing Street during Partygate and even slept on office floors as the PM joined in the boozing. The allegations were made by a whistleblower to the BBC's Laura Koonsberg in an episode of Panorama earlier tonight. Uh, just to stress, no one was on the record uh, in that documentary whatsoever. My superstar panel back with me now, former editor and current columnist at The Daily Star, Dawn Neeson, the conservative commentator Calvin Robinson and the author and journalist Rebecca Reid. They were never going to take it lying down. They've worked too hard, campaigned too long to let the police's comprehensive half a million pound party gate probe to be the end of it. Nope, the Liberal media and political establishment, as you've just seen, they won't rest until the Prime Minister is undemocratically forced out of number 10. The so-called Fizzgate furore is just their latest pass at the PM as they struggle to accept he received just one fixed penalty notice from police. The Craven left, once delighted with the Met when it opened the investigation, have turned on the force now because it failed to deliver the result and resignation they so desperately desired. And, of course, the failed London Mayor, Sadiq Khan, couldn't resist some cheap political point scoring today 
before later demanding a detailed explanation from the Met for failing to satisfy his political end game. The photograph that I saw for the first time yesterday will have people across the country scratching their heads how it is that even more fines haven't been issued uh, for those who work in Downing Street, particularly against the uh, Prime Minister. We please by consent in our country. It's really important when there are questions of integrity directed towards the police service. Uh, they respond by reassuring people there's been a proper investigation. I think the police should be providing clarity how they reach their conclusions. And I'm looking forward to the police explaining how they reached some of the conclusions they did. Translation, the police didn't come up with the result that I wanted, so now they must explain themselves. He's a politician telling the police that. Very disturbing. Two Whitehall sources told The Times today that Boris had suggested to Sue Gray that she didn't even need to publish her full report, given the investigation by Scotland Yard. And, I mean, it's hardly surprising to me he said that, given her report has turned into another political smear campaign, with Gray taking advice from Brexit and Boris hating Labour Party member Daniel Stillitz. So, Partygate has now been proven, I think, uh, to be a political witch hunt by the left, Calvin Robinson, because they're not prepared to accept the police investigation. No, we've had Sue Gray's report, we've had the Met Police report, and they're still gunning for more. They still want the Prime Minister's head on a platter. It's clear that this is a witch hunt by the political left, by the mainstream media, by people that want to get rid of Boris. For what reason, I don't know. It could be because of Brexit. It could be that there are people wanting to replace him. But th that's neither here nor there. It's not appropriate for them to be challenging, not challenging, but wanting to take him out on something that he's been proven not guilty of. There was that one fine, that's it. They want more, more, more blood, please. And we said, you know, let's wait for Sue Gray's report. We've had it. And why do we need that anyway? He's right. Why do we need her report anyway? We've had the Met police looking into this mm. and finding people where necessary. It's just never ending, is it? R Rebecca Reed, I mean, how do you feel about your side of politics all of a sudden questioning the police findings because they didn't go the way that they wanted. Surely my that's side, really worrying. My side doesn't like the police anyway, which I'm comfortable with. I find authority uncomfortable. Um, so that's a fairly normal thing for us. What I don't understand is why we're still obsessing at Partygate when the obvious, if we're trying to score points, cost of living crisis is the very mm. obvious place to go. That's what people actually care about. That's what's actually important. That's what really could be fixed. And also the major issue is that if we got rid of, if, if my side, if we're going to call it that, was successful in getting rid of Boris Johnson, that would actually make it harder to win the next election. The best thing that could happen is for him to be left in oh, place. Oh, I disagree with that. I, to I, I think new disagree blood is, with that. I New blood you is much harder to fight. No idea how popular Boris Johnson remains, especially mm. in the Red Wall. When you were off on maternity leave, you still must have seen those local I, election results. I saw literally nothing. Okay, then. so there was the local. <laughs> okay, let me tell you. Let I me tell you. Let me tell you. You're going to have to trust me. Today. You're going to have to trust me. This There's is not skewed. Cut. I'm giving you fair and balanced uh, analysis of the local election results. Very good for Labour in London. Mm. Around all of your you sort of quinoa Blue munching head, folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. All, all of you lot. Yes. Uh, very bad in, in the Red Wall, who, mm -hmm. by and large, stayed loyal to Boris. OK, but historically, it's much easier to get rid of somebody who's got a long track record of things going wrong than it is somebody new. And if they got rid of Boris towards the end of his tenure, somebody going, OK, well, look, it's still the Tories, it's still got all the good stuff he liked, but it's not Boris. Boris Johnson's a rule-breaking politician, though, Jordan Neeson. He isn't a Gordon Brown, he isn't a John Major. And, look, all I'm saying... I'm not saying Boris hasn't been damaged by this. I think he has so, yes, been damaged has. by this. Yep, I think Partygate was bad. I don't think it was, let's talk about it for five months and do BBC specials on it five months later for an hour, bad. But I think it was bad. But I think people are underestimating... Boris Johnson's popularity still. Well, there's a reason he's called the greased piglet by David Cameron, isn't there? Because he does have a habit of getting away with, with all sorts of things. Um, look, I'm still angry. I've always been angry about the hypocrisy. Still? I am still angry. Are I'm you not, ever going to move on, Dawn? I'm not angry about the parties per se, but I'm angry about the way they terrorise this country. No, I'm angry about that. Unnecessarily, yeah, 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 with yeah, yeah, nonsensical yeah. rules. Agree, agree. Angry about that. But angry. at some point, Dawn, doesn't the time come? This is the point I was going to make. What I want to do now is... 
and, and I agree with Rebecca on this, both parties are as bad as each other, both leaders, I think, are as bad as one another. Um, and what I want them yeah, to do now... Because we saw Keir and Rayner breaking the rules too. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I'm, I'm, you know, they're both as bad as one another. I want them now to move on and concentrate on getting this country back up and running properly. We, we, you know, the cost, you know, the inflation costs, um, you know, the power crisis, the war in Ukraine. You still can't see a GP, all of that stuff. But the one thing I'm really annoyed about today was Sadiq Khan going, well, I want the Met to investigate. Why have they done this? Why haven't they done that? You know what he really needs to investigate? The reason that solved cases of crime are down 35% yeah. in London year exactly. on year. Exactly, because you've dragged 12 officers off, off this uh, because because the left wing cravenly demand that the Met Police must reopen the party gate investigation, which they didn't want to do in the but first half place. Half a million pounds, yeah. Dan. It, it's half a complete million. disgrace. There were over 8,000 sex yeah. offences in that four to months. Totally. And, and Calvin, I, I'm, I'm sorry. While I do believe that back in December, I think it was December the 8th or something, that this was a legitimate story that should be covered and we should discuss it, I really believe the mainstream media have shown what they're all about. I think they've undermined themselves. I think it's great for a channel like GB News because people can now see that the likes of BBC News, ITV mm -hmm. News, Channel 4 News, Sly News, mm -hmm. these are campaigners now. They are political campaigners because they have barely covered Beargate and Keir Starmer. And it's not working, is it? It might have had a little dent on Boris's reputation, but actually his reaction to the Ukraine situation mm. has bolstered yes. his support and he's back up in the ratings. So they might as well give up and report on the actual news that's taking place rather than obsessing over party games. Now, first they came for US comedy legend Dave Chappelle, but now our very own Ricky Gervais, the legend, is the target of attacks by woke and humorless critics of his latest Netflix show. His new stand-up, Supernature, dropped on the streaming platform this morning and jokes like this about the trans debate have got joyless whinges raging. No, women. I, I mean the old-fashioned ones. You know, the old-fashioned women. Oh, God. You know, the ones with wombs. Oh. <laughs> Those <laughs> dinosaurs. Oh. No, I love the, the new women. I know the new women. They're great, aren't they? The, you know, the new ones we've been seeing lately. The, the ones with beards and <laughs> They're as good as... They're as good as gold. I love them. <laughs> now it's the old fashioned. And now the old fashioned, they're like, oh, they want to use our toilets. Why shouldn't they use your toilets? For ladies. They are ladies. Look at their pronouns. <laughs> what about this person that isn't a lady? Well, his penis. <laughs> Her penis, you <laughs> bigot. <laughs> Don't tell me you didn't laugh. Unsurprisingly, Ricky is now being branded transphobic, despite explaining in childlike detail during the gig how jokes are simply what they say on the tin. A joke. Misery Guts reviewers at the Independent newspaper gave him a paltry two stars in their write-up, accusing the office star of humiliating trans people. This latest comedy cry fest comes, of course, after Liberal Netflix star failed to censor Dave Chappelle last year when he cracked similar trans gags and deeply offensive, apparently, Jimmy Carr, too. After sticking up for Chappelle and Carr, ditching a breachy show from Meghan Markle and now letting Ricky run riot at his brilliant best, it appears Netflix have finally got the message that I've been saying for some time. If you go woke, you go broke. So good on Ricky. I have to say he's my favourite comedian in the world. He's just amazing for tackling the trans debate head on. Now, a truly bonkers Balenciaga fashion show dazzled crowds on the trading floor of the New York Stock Exchange this week. And it had all the trademark high fashion moments. Uncomfortable outfits, a front row studded with celebrities and confusing concepts. But in the midst of it all, one eagle-eyed viewer made a possibly startling discovery about the identity of one of the latex obscured models, tweeting the theory, which I believe, by the way, that the second model was Theresa May. You can't fool me. I know that walk and posture from anywhere. So could it really be Theresa May? Could it really be? I think it is, but I'll let you decide. So let's reveal the Theresas. First, we have the unknown Balenciaga model who <laughs> means business, charging along the runway in head-to-toe sequins. Look, and here we have the former Prime Minister <laughs> strutting on stage at the Conservative Party conference back in 2018 to the ABBA 
banger dancing queen. So now let's compare, let's compare. You can see the models show the same posture as the former PM. It's uncanny. So could Theresa May really have started moonlighting at the fashion brand, favoured by the likes of Kanye West and Kim Kardashian? Well, Parliament has been in recess. Mrs May might have been practising that catwalk strut in a field of wheat, right, Calvin Robinson? You're, you, you're hysterical. You love her. It's her, right? It's not her. And she does love fashion. She loves yes. clothes. So it would make sense. I miss her. She's been on a remarkably good diet, if it is her. It has to be said. Oh, oh, burn. But well, the size of that model, I mean, come on. John Neeson, Calvin Sorry. Robinson, Rebecca Reid, thank you so much. Coming up, should the police be forced to complete mandatory training on black history and embrace wokery? Plus, after I revealed, with the family's permission, the horrific news earlier today that our friend Thomas Markle has suffered a really serious stroke. I'm going to call on Meghan to end this one-sided feud. All that in the media buzz at 10.30. But first, do we know enough about the long-term health consequences of the mRNA COVID vaccine? Top Professor Christine Stavel ben reveals the results of a bombshell new study that raises important questions about the overall efficacy of jabs from the likes of Pfizer and Moderna. She's here next. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, and that the left fights the right, and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was, in fact, a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. <laughs> yeah. We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Now, some of the most maligned people in the UK are those who dare to raise questions about the vaccine. But while the MSM doggedly continues to ignore the topic, a bombshell new study by a distinguished team of Danish researchers has revealed death rates from the mRNA vaccine send danger signals. That's their term. The team, led by my next guest, Professor Christine Stabel ben found no statistically meaningful evidence in trial data that mRNA vaccines manufactured by the likes of Pfizer and Moderna reduced all-cause mortality, which is overall deaths from any cause. In fact, they found the number of deaths from other causes, including cardiovascular deaths, appear to be increased in this group, compensating for the beneficial effects of the vaccines on COVID. Breaking down the findings in online publication Unheard, Professor at Stanford School of Medicine, Dr. Jay Bhattacharya, writes, these preliminary results stand in sharp contrast to the unambiguous message from public health agencies and governments worldwide, which granted emergency authorization to the vaccines based on evidence from the trials that the vaccines reduce the likelihood of getting symptomatic COVID. From a public health perspective, prevention of COVID symptoms is not as important as prevention of death or disease transmission, which the randomized trials did not study. 
But despite the significance of her findings, Professor Stapple Ben feels there just isn't the correct level of interest. Speaking to Unheard, she said, I have been in this game now for almost 30 years, studying vaccines and finding these non-specific effects, which have been very controversial. There are strong powers out there that don't really want to hear about them. But to me, this is good news. It means that we can optimise the use of vaccines to not only be strong protective efforts against vaccine disease, but we can also optimise their use in terms of overall health. Well, I'm delighted to say that Professor Christine Stabble Ben joins me now. Professor, really fascinating results. Uh, obviously, I know it's early days, there's a lot more work to be done. But when you look at all cause mortality, do you feel comfortable to say now that it doesn't look like the mRNA COVID vaccines, you know, the vaccines by the likes of Pfizer and Moderna, were as good? as, for example, the AstraZeneca vaccines. Just to give you a bit of background, our group has for decades studied the overall health effects of vaccines, um, the, their effects on overall mortality. Uh, we've done that in an African context with high mortality, and there it became very evident that vaccines, in addition to protecting against the vaccine disease, also have effects on the immune system, which affect how the immune system subsequently respond to a broad range of other unrelated uh, diseases. Um, these effects we've called non-specific effects. Uh, they are generally accepted now in research, uh, among researchers, but unfortunately this knowledge has not really come into uh, the systems for testing and approving the vaccines, uh, also mm. new vaccines. So that means that we actually don't have the studies to actually document the full health effect of vaccines before they are being uh, tested, launched and uh, and and used in life. Yes, because, because to be clear, your argument is that the vaccines might work or not work, but in this case, they do work against what they are meant to work for COVID-19, but they have other effects on the body sometimes they might too. Have other effects, yes. They might Positive and effect. negative. Yes, so what we've seen is that, in general, the pattern we have observed is that live attenuated vaccines, which contain the pathogen in a weakened form, these live vaccines can uh, strengthen the immune system and the general health of the children who receive it so that they're better. So that's the AstraZeneca the jab, to be clear. We were actually not sure about either the AstraZeneca or the other adenovirus vector vaccines or the mRNA vaccines for that sake, because these are two new vaccine types. So what we saw was the live vaccines were beneficial, the non-live vaccines, I should say. We saw that they were actually harmful in the sense that they, particularly for girls, they came and protected against the vaccine diseases, but they could actually come at a high cost, namely the increased risk of other diseases in the females for reasons we are still trying to understand. Which but we must understand. And just to clarify, Christine, sorry, when you say non-live, are you referring to the mRNA vaccines there like Pfizer and Moderna? No, well, what I'm, I'm trying to say is that we didn't know uh, right from the beginning with those two new uh, types of vaccines, both the adenovirus vectors vaccines and the mRNA vaccines, whether they would behave as live and or non-live. Uh, we were actually in doubt because both of them are, in principle, they're new vaccines and they could have behaved like live vaccines. What we see now when we are looking at the overall mortality effect of the vaccines and compare them to each other, then... There is a highly statistically significant difference in their effect on overall mortality. So what we see is that the adenovirus vector vaccines like the AstraZeneca reduce all-cause mortality much more than explained just by the prevention of COVID death. And they also reduce cardiovascular death. In general, they reduce all the non-COVID, non-accident deaths significantly also. So this suggests that the adenovirus vector vaccines, even though the adenovirus has been engineered so that it doesn't replicate, it isn't really live, live in the sense that it, it, it can um, behave like a live virus, it, they, it nonetheless seems to stimulate the immune system. At least that's that's a hint that they might stimulate the immune system beneficially and, and, and generally improve the health of the recipients beyond their effect on yes. COVID-19. But in contrast, we don't see this effect uh, of the mRNA vaccines. I have to emphasize that the vaccines weren't tested against each other. That's actually what we are advocating, that we need to have studies now comparing head-to-head -head recipients of the... Absolutely. Uh, friend, friend, those who received adenovirus vector vaccines with those who receive mRNA vaccines. Because a if we are anywhere near the truth with this effect, it actually has enormous uh, public health implications.
Well, it does indeed. And I just wanted to pick up a little bit more on that point regarding the mRNA vaccines. So the trial data shows that there was hardly any statistically meaningful evidence that the mRNA vaccines reduced all cause mortalities. And that's because there was an increase, at least in your sample, of cardiovascular deaths in particular. Do you have any way of knowing whether those cardiovascular deaths are connected to the mRNA vaccine? No, and I don't have any any possible way of saying that the vaccines are protecting or not protecting or increasing all-cause mortality because numbers are so small. So this is a real pity. This is because the system for testing vaccines doesn't demand that there is also a demonstration of effect on all-cause mortality because the trials were large, but they were stopped after a few months when they started vaccinating the control groups. So we only have short follow-up. We only have a total of 31 deaths in the mRNA trials, uh, the, the, the Pfizer and the Moderna trials. So that is absolutely too little to say. We, we can say they aren't distri they are distributed with 16 deaths in the mRNA group and 15 in the uh, in the placebo group. And overall, there's no indication that there's a reduction of all-cause mortality. But the confidence interval, as we call it, ar around this estimate is so broad that it doesn't exclude that mm. there could be a quite a strong beneficial effect of these vaccines on all-cause mortality. Uh, but on the other hand, it doesn't exclude either that there could be uh, an increase in overall mortality. What we see for cardiovascular diseases is a 45% increased risk of dying from cardiovascular diseases in the mRNA group versus the placebo group. But again, the confidence intervals are uh, very, very broad. It doesn't exclude a beneficial effect of these vaccines on cardiovascular deaths either. I know. So, I think our and bottom line here is that, that we don't have the data to say anything about the overall health effects of mRNA vaccines, but that is obviously a big problem since we're well, now indeed. distributing. Exactly. To, to, to everyone, we're all being expected to be jabbed, some people four or even five times now. So that's why I just want to ask you finally, Professor, what you mean by, by this comment. There are strong powers out there that don't really want to hear about your results. Are you talking about Big Pharma there? Are you talking about organisations like the World Health Organisation? Because to me, this, this research that you've done is utterly critical and people should be pouring resources into it to, to, to make sure uh, that we find out. I completely agree. I think the big powers are both big pharma and also the public health institutions because you can see the the. I mean, I'm I'm I love the potential in these uh, studies, these non-specific effects, the 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 potential we have for improving vaccination schedules and actually making them cleverer and more useful, etc. But I think they they are raising some challenges to to big pharma and to public health in terms of how vaccines are tested and uh, and regulated and approved. And, and that goes for new vaccines being developed. It actually also goes for the vaccines we have already because, I mean, unknown to most people, none of the vaccines that we use today in vaccination programs globally were assessed for their effects on overall health before they were being introduced. So everybody was so sure at that time that vaccines did nothing but protect against the vaccine disease. So it didn't seem necessary to test them for other effects. So once it was proven that the vaccines protected against the vaccine disease, well, then any kind of assessment stopped. But, but with this new knowledge, it's actually time to also go back and look at our current vaccination schedules and, say, and, and, and really assess whether they are achieving what we want them to achieve, namely improving the overall health of the recipients, not just protecting them against specific diseases. Very important point, very important work that you're doing. Please keep in touch with us on it. That's the Professor in Global Health at the University of Southern Denmark, Christine Stavel ben We approach the manufacturers, by the way, of the main mRNA vaccines used here in the UK, because we give you both sides of the story here on GB News, Pfizer and Moderna. Neither got back to us about Professor Stavel bens study. Pfizer have said previously that hundreds of millions of people have received its vaccine, while the benefits of shots based on the mRNA technology used by both Moderna and Pfizer, BioNTech and preventing COVID-19 continue to outweigh the risks regulators in the United States, EU and the World Health Organization have said.
coming up. Is there any justification for continuing to muzzle staff, patients and visitors in healthcare settings? Well, Dr Gary Sidley has been calling for UK leaders and the NHS to axe face masks in a campaign supported by thousands. He's uncancelled with me soon. But next, should the police undergo mandatory lessons on black history and embrace wokeness? I'd rather they were tackling crimes, but we'll see what my superstar panel think. Plus, as we hear at Dan Wharton tonight, pray for Thomas Markle's recovery following his horrifying stroke. I call for Megan to send an olive branch to her estranged father. All that in the Media Buzz next. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, and that the left fights the right, and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was, in fact, a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. <laughs> yeah. We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Let's return now to tomorrow's news tonight in our Media Buzz. Got loads more front pages in now. The Eye leads with news that household energy bills are set to rise again by £800 this autumn as the regulator Ofgem raises the price cap by some 40% to a staggering £2,800 a year. The revelation, the latest in a cost of living bro to British households. The Guardian leads with the Chancellor's scramble to find ways to ease the cost of living crisis as energy bills look set to hit £2,800. Sunak could announce a package of measures as soon as tomorrow to help alleviate the growing pressures put on families with the paper reporting. The growing inflation crisis has even put the rejected windfall tax back on the agenda. The Daily Telegraph is also leading on the plans to announce a windfall tax within days to help ease the cost of living crunch. And in a scaremongering address at the World Economic Forum, billionaire investor George Soros has claimed the war in Ukraine could lead to full-scale World War III and, quote, end Western civilization. There we go. Number 10 staff reveal a culture of drinking and parties. That leads The Independent, head of the publication of the long-awaited Sue Gray report. The paper describes claims by former Downing Street staffers of chaotic lockdown parties with wine time Fridays, where bins overflowed with empty bottles. My superstar panel have returned. Now, former editor, current columnist at the Daily Star, Dawn Neeson, the conservative commentator, Calvin Robinson, and back with us tonight for the first time since giving birth, the author and journalist, Rebecca Reed. I don't know about you, but I'd quite like police officers to spend their time learning how to solve, you know, 
stabbings and things. But nope, apparently coppers are best placed studying up on black history in an effort to curb racism in their ranks. As part of a newly released action plan, officers have been set mandatory training that will cover the history of policing black communities and the ethnic disproportionality currently seen in arrests and use of force. Forces in England and Wales will also be made to explain policies or practices where racial disparity exists and ensure black staff serve the most diverse communities. It comes as Ab uh, Abambola Johnson, a top lawyer and the chairwoman of a new scrutiny board, who, by the way, has <laughs> previously said she wants to end funding for forces. Of course she has. Uh, she urged officers to embrace being called woke, saying, I want to see a de-escalation in reactions to labels like woke. I want to see police thinking about what that definition actually means, because I don't really see how you can be anti-racist and not be comfortable with that terminology. Sorry, am I insane for wanting police, the people who are meant to protect us, ensure law and order to be tough rather than a load of woke snowflakes? Isn't this just going to embolden criminals and make officers have doubts about pursuing crimes where there's a chance they could be accused of prejudice, Rebecca Reed? Why do we want our police officers to be woke? Well, I mean, I, you know me, I, I have a very healthy distrust of all authority and I don't particularly like the police on a grand scheme. Individually, many lovely police officers. As an organisation, I really, really actively dislike the police. Um, one of my major issues is that it is uh, there's a real pipeline between very, very stressful jobs like being in the army, where a lot of trauma is sustained, being funnelled into the police with no proper support, no proper sort of guidance on how to get past being shot at for, a, for sort of weeks at a time and a lot of the time and also, and the police have a disproportionately high level of um, domestic abusers of people who have checkered histories and behavior towards women so I think there is a very real issue with the police whether anybody has ever actually been improved by being put on a mandatory training afternoon is very questionable. I've sat through a lot of instructional videos. I'm not sure I've ever listened to them. So I do well, think... Well, and it's more than that, though, because they're also being told uh, you've got to be woke. Well, I think what they're trying to do is tackle the fact that young black men are disproportionately targeted by the police, particularly in London. And that is true, and it would be incredibly uncomfortable if you were a young black man to know that the police were going to look at you and make assumptions about you. Um, however, again, I don't think that whatever half assed training video they're made to sit through is going to tackle institutionalised racism. But Dawn Neeson, it's, it's, it's who is behind the half assed uh, instructional video, and the woman behind this <clears throat> this instruction is someone who actually wants to defund police force. Well, quiet, it's very confusing. Can we just make it stop? I just want the, the police to nick criminals. Yeah. That's what I want. It's not complicated. We know crime detection in London is 35% down year on year. We know rape prosecutions are actually just basically not happening at the moment. They're at an all-time low. And if we are going to make the police overly woke, can we just concentrate not just on racism, but misogyny as well? I mean, Sarah Everard, can I mention? Nicole Smallman and Bieber Henry, the two sisters that were murdered and then the police stood and took selfies with them. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's bigger issues than racism going on. Why are we so focused on racism? Racism is seen in absolutely every area of life at but, the moment. But Calvin there Robinson, is a problem, but can we sort out the misogyny but, as well? But Calvin Robinson, I'm with you on to, that, Dawn. But to me, that's that's the same thing, though. If we go to all of our police officers and say, you're sexist, you're racist, oh, you're probably homophobic too, let's throw that in because we throw it in for everything these days, you're transphobic, we're going to be creating a generation of weak police officers. We're already there, aren't we? We've already got the police officers wearing the rainbow helmets, prancing <coughs> around at Pride. Why is that what? weak? Because it doesn't... Does that put fear into you? I, why should I be afraid? The, you shouldn't be afraid of the police. Of course you should. You shouldn't Absolutely be, not. The they shouldn't be there to, to frighten crime. you. They're not there to look pretty. But, the, so, but, but I don't need to be frightened. What about the police okay, What about the police dancing the, the, with the Extinction Rebellion activists? They're not there to grind. Well, again, I don't think it's fun. a problem. They're I think... to be authoritative figures to prevent crime. I don't this idea that they need to be woke, this, this woke-splaining thing gets on my nerves, that actually woke is, is being open to social injustice. And no, if you have to explain it, it's not being used in the correct way. We all know what woke means. It's, it's virtue signaling, it's jumping on bandwagons about race, gender, sexuality, and all of these issues. And to suggest that racism is institutional in the police force is a lazy 
uh, argument because it takes away the individual responsibility <coughs> in, of malicious racists that do need to be punished for being racist. And, and I think Dawn's right in that it's not just about racism, it's about sexism, it's about all the other things. It's but if it is about racism, why is it only about black racism? Why is it always... Yeah. the same the police need to learn but, black history. Why should they not learn Arabic history, but Chinese think, history, Japanese history? I don't it's think Chinese... obsession but, with black. And you mentioned that black uh, people are getting disproportionately... Men, men, black men. That's because black men are disproportionately committing crimes. It's, a, it's an issue that needs addressing. No, we need to look at the social issues in central London. I, I just, I just want the police to be able to focus solely on crime and where the crimes are being committed. And as soon as you put all of these ideas into police officers' heads, and we know, by the way, this has existed for a long time. There's been examples and where senior police officers said they, they would have boards up on their office with the most wanted criminals who they were targeting. And when... The bosses came around, they'd have to quickly take them down because they were worried that too many of them were non-white. We know this is going on, and, and I think the police, I'm going to say it, need to man up, actually, it's going to make them and, double and stop it's not this let them woke spelling. Or a woman up, up. Or a woman up, up by the way. Yes. <laughs> And, um, and let's be honest, I mean, we're being encouraged to go shoplifting now, aren't we, by the police? I mean, shoplifting's fine yeah. if you, if you, you well, know, I'm sorry, can't... You, well, you can't, can't but also, to buy stuff. Sorry, from personal experience, if you're a white girl, you can get away with shoplifting very easily, and that's exactly the problem with policing. Trust me, I was a teenager. No-one should get away with shoplifting. Full stop. Now, it was with a heavy heart this evening that I revealed the news that Meghan Markle's father, Thomas, a friend of the show, has suffered a major stroke overnight. The 77-year-old was rushed to hospital in the US one week before we here at GB News were about to make his dream of travelling to London for the Platinum Jubilee and potentially reuniting with his estranged daughter and son-in-law, Harry, come true. It's a tragic turn of events when you think about how excited he was when he made the announcement on this show last month. It's even better to hear the news that finally, after missing the wedding all those years ago, you're going to be coming to the UK next month for the Queen's Platinum Jubilee celebrations. Talk to me. I'm looking forward to it and uh, I'm going to show my respects for the Queen and I'm going to uh, uh, make sure that the Queen understands that my, my entire family respects the Queen and the Royals, and we, uh, we, we admire them, and uh, we, we, want, we want them to know that's how we feel about them, and that's how we feel about England. Now, I've been across this terrible situation throughout the day. We'd actually agreed with Thomas and his daughter, Samantha, that we weren't going to talk about his medical emergency for just a few days to give Thomas the time to rec recuperate. It's still a very... Uh, acute situation and he can't speak at the moment but we found out earlier it was about to be broken by a US website after a leak from within the hospital so Sam who also appeared many times on this show and hopefully she'll be here tomorrow night said to me we ask for privacy for the family for his health and well-being he just needs peace and rest we are pay praying it's a travesty how much he's been tortured and how much he's had to go through thanks to my sister's disregard the past few years. That is unforgivable. And there is fury among the Markle family, I can tell you that, that Thomas, who has, as I said, lost his speech, has been left to fund his own medical treatment with multi-millionaire Meghan providing no financial support since their very public falling out. Uh, when we went to air, she was one of, she was the only one of his children, in fact, not to have reached out. Uh, Thomas was determined to visit the UK next week, regardless of his recent alien health, galvanised by the hope that being in the same city as Harry and Meghan would bring them together after he was forced to miss their 2018 wedding due to a heart attack. Here's what he said to me previously about his desire to reconcile. I'm getting the feeling that if they know I'm coming, they won't be coming. Mm. But uh, if they do come, I, I would love to... I would love to... Uh, reach out and, uh, and, and speak with them and, and, and try to figure out what, what went wrong and how we can repair it. Uh, I don't see that happening, but I certainly would like to try. Now I've got to know Thomas o over the past few years. He is a good soul whose family means everything to him. I pray for his recovery, but even more, I pray that this brush with death will give Megan
the opportunity to reconsider her decision to freeze out the dad she used to publicly praise as her beloved daddy on social media websites. Life's just too short, isn't it, to treat your blood relatives with such cruelty. So Godspeed, Thomas. London will be waiting for you when you recover. Coming up, the crowning moment of the show as I name today's greatest Briton and union jackass. But first, is it time to axe face masks from healthcare settings? Dr. Gary Sidley has launched a campaign calling for the NHS to unmuzzle staff, patients and visitors. He joins me in just a few seconds right after we take a look at what's coming up in tomorrow's show. Coming up on Dan Wooden tonight, will Sturgeon's holier-than-thou attitude and entitlement be her undoing and sink her independence dream? The new chairman of the Scottish Tories, Craig Hoy, is taking a stand for ordinary Scots who don't buy into the First Minister's cult of personality. He'll join me live. Plus, positive professor Carol Sikora brings a dose of medical reason to monkeypox hysteria. And there's unfiltered opinion from US superstar journalist Megyn Kelly, columnist extraordinaire Rod Little, and my superstar panel. The Daily Mail columnist Amanda Platel, the entrepreneur and activist Adam Brooks, and the broadcaster Ashley James. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. But it's time now for Uncancelled. And this is where Britain's top commentators speak out on controversial issues without the fear of the cancel culture sweeping the rest of the media. Now, despite mask wearing being confined these days to just the scared and neurotic, the theatre of face muscles is still enforced across most healthcare settings across the UK. But our next guest is tackling the final bastion of COVID ridiculousness head on with a campaign to get masks scrapped from hospitals, dentists and other medical venues. Dr Gary Sidley, a retired NHS consultant clinical uh, psychologist, is part of the Smile Free campaign against forced masking in the UK, a movement backed by over 7,000 signatories of an open letter to NHS bosses that includes scientists, health professionals and patients. He argues there is a lack of robust scientific evidence to support wearing face nappies and they in fact do more harm than good by impairing communication, re-traumatising victims of sexual and physical abuse and giving elderly folk even bigger risks of falls and confusion. Dr. Sidley, great to have you here. Is, is there any justification to continue this mask wearing madness? No, I struggle to see any, Dan. Um, all the robust evidence points in one direction that masks are ineffective in any setting. Uh, and there's a whole range of um, uh, harms associated with them. Uh, as you've already said, in, in healthcare, there are some specific damages that are problematic in healthcare, like impaired communication, if people can't hear what's being said and there's no nonverbal communication, uh, that's always bad. The doctor struggles to understand the problem, the patient struggles to understand the solution. Elderly people are disadvantaged with their um, hard of hearing, their um, confusion on many occasions, you know, all that is exacerbated and they are heavy attenders at our health set settings, people with emotional problems from traumatic abuse, sexual and physical abuse in the past are particularly triggered by masks. And they again are regular visitors to healthcare settings. So no, there isn't any justification. There's no rational basis for it. It should stop immediately. And our campaign at Smile Free has put together an open letter to the uh, chief executives of NHS England, NHS Wales, NHS Scotland, NHS Northern Ireland, basically urging them to remove the mass requirement with immediate effect. And as you said, we've already had 7,000 plus signatures, yeah. all the range of people, including you know, professionals, over 1,700 professionals, doctors, surgeons, consultants, frontline nursing staff, many more. So there's a lot of momentum behind this, Dan. Well, indeed, I and, and I don't want to get your hopes up, but the Daily Skeptic website, which is this brilliant website run by Toby Young, has reported tonight that the requirement for healthcare workers to wear face masks in clinical settings is to be dropped by NHS Trust from Monday. Now, that's according to a source within the health service. 
uh, but they said they're not sure whether all trusts will make this change at the same time. But it seems like maybe you're already making a bit of a difference, Dr. Sidley. Yeah. Maybe our campaign has already had an impact. Um, well, let's see. That is true, let's see. If that is true, that is tremendous news, Dan. Absolutely. Well, let's hope. hope. Let's hope so. People, because, you know, if you want to wear a mask, fine. fine. If you want to wear a mask, if fine. People, but yeah, no one should be forced right. to. No one should be forced no, to. Dr. Gary Sidley, thank I, I, you so much. If your many tens of thousands of viewers want to sign our letter, they can do oh, yes, so. where can we do it? Smile, smilefree.org forward slash NHS. Great Smile stuff, free. Dr. Gary Sidley. Thank you so much. The retired NHS you. consultant, clinical psychologist, and the man behind the Smile Free Anti Mask Mandate campaign, which may well be working already. Time will tell. But it's time now to reveal today's greatest Britain and Union jackass. My superstar panel back with me, Dawn Neeson. Who is your nominee for today's Greatest Britain? I never thought I'd hear myself say this. It's Michael Gove. Hey! Whoa. The levelling up... Min I know, sorry. The levelling up minister who has written to all local authorities urging them to ditch the red tape about jubilee parties. That it, people are being sent 23 yeah, pages like of forms this. for a little party. OK, good, good news. Sort of on the royal theme, Rebecca Reid. Oh, well, either the Elizabeth line or Queen Elizabeth herself. But, yeah, it's very exciting. We've got a new line. Haven't had one of those since, uh, I believe, the Jubilee line. And who doesn't love a bit of new tube? And Calvin Robinson, your nominee. Uh, we're not on the same politics, but I think it's absolutely fantastic what he's doing. Ricky Gervais, brilliant comedian. He's brave because he t tells jokes and he doesn't care. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's my winner. He's my winner. Ricky Gervais, well done for uh, not worrying about being cancelled. Should we have a, have a little little reminder yeah. again of why? Not all women. I, I mean, the old-fashioned ones. You know, the old-fashioned women. Oh, God. You know, the ones with wombs. Oh. <laughs> oh, he's on good form. Union Jackass time now. Dawn Neeson, your nominee. Right, I got very angry about this. It's a bit nebulous, this one, but it's all the people that seem to think that flying the Union flag down the Mall and in towns and cities all over the country makes it us equivalent to Nazi Germany. They know nothing about Nazi Germany if they really think that's the case. This was absolutely shocking this week, I... Dawn. I mean, people who used to be sane, used to be sane, like that woman, India Willoughby, uh, oh. you, you know, talking about Nazis and tanks. And I, I just thought, this is proof you've lost the plot. This is proof you've lost the plot. Uh, Calvin Robinson, your Union Jackass nominee. Yeah, and these people that say it's fascist to fly the British flag, they're also the ones with the EU, EU flag in their bio. Yeah, quite. They, the flag. <laughs> yeah. Um, my Union Jackass is the mainstream media as a whole for just constantly attacking the Prime Minister, wanting to drag him down. They have an agenda. It's inappropriate. And Rebecca Reid, you're back. Who has got you worked up for this past few weeks of maternity leave, I, I know, shudder to think. I will admit that I have not read a newspaper since oh, I had Rebecca, a baby. However, so I have decided... Every week before you came back. <laughs> I decided to just go for the old faithful Nadine Dorries. Why? Um, not because she outsells me as an author. Leave um, alone. But because of the licence fee fiasco. But I think... you We all know my feelings on this, so I, but I will concede to Dawn because I think it's an incredibly sensible... If it's not the Holocaust, don't compare it to the Holocaust. Easy rule. But, but can I just say on, on Nadine Dorries... Rebecca Reed, she is doing a spectacular She's job. So Why she is almost she like greatest she is not. pushing forward with plans to privatise Channel 4? Tick something the Tories have said that they will do for a long time. Can I just She's remind scrapping you? the licence fee. She's getting the BBC in line. She's going at them okay. for their lack of impartiality. What is not to like? Because the BBC is so much more than news. I know that not that you guys don't like the news they do, but the BBC creates the best drama possibly yeah, in the going. world. Anyway, and it's I am going to go with Dawn Neeson. I'm going to follow your advice. And the Union Jackass winner is all of those losers who have compared the Union Jack flag down the Mall and uh, Regent Street to Nazi Germany. Rebecca Reid, it was great to have you back. Thank you, too, to Calvin Robinson and Dawn Neeson, a fabulous superstar panel, as ever on a Tuesday. I'm back again tomorrow night from 9pm. Headliners is up next, so thanks for your company tonight. Good night. Hello, I'm Ada McGiven from the Met Office. Further showers for many during the next 24 hours. More prolonged rain, especially in the west, as we start off Wednesday, and increasingly windy during Wednesday and Thursday. A number of low pressure systems are affecting our weather at the moment. One clearing away to the northeast during the rest of the day and overnight, and then another low turning up for the start of Wednesday from the west. 
that means it will be fairly changeable, fairly unsettled. But Tuesday showers clearing away from the east through the evening and then clear skies for much of the night, especially for the Midlands, East Anglia and the southeast, where temperatures will fall into the single figures, perhaps low single figures in some sheltered spots, whilst much of Scotland, Northern Ireland, Western England, as well as Wales, turns cloudy through the night and it'll be a wet and windy start to Wednesday. Those winds reaching gale force around exposed parts of northern Scotland. The rain in Scotland, Northern Ireland, Northern Western England, as well as Wales, turns to showers by the afternoon. And after a sunny start for East Anglia in the southeast, it turns cloudier and breezier by the afternoon. But temperatures still hovering around average for the time of year. 19 in London, 16 uh, to 18 Celsius generally elsewhere. And any rain peters out through the evening with clear spells for many at first on Wednesday night. But through the early hours, once again, cloud and some outbreaks of rain turn up across Northern Ireland, parts of southwest Scotland, northwest England, and North Wales. Elsewhere, showers continuing for northern Scotland, clear spells for the southeast corner as we start off Thursday. Another breezy day to come. Again, the risk of gales for northern Scotland, along with some fairly lively showers here. A slice of cloud and outbreaks of rain through central parts, brighter and drier to the far south and southeast, where it will be turning warmer. And then that warmer, drier weather in the south spreads to most parts by Saturday. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. 